Hello everyone, welcome to our lecture. So today we're going to be looking at antigens and antibodies and the adaptive immune system. So here we can just see, quick overview, we have our resting B cell with our membrane-bound immunoglobulin. Then we have an encounter with an antigen. Sorry, I just heard my cat. And then we have our B cell engaging with the bacterium. And we also have our plasma cells, which are effector molecules of the B cells. So today we'll be looking at a lot of stuff related to, um, you know, our immunology and vaccinology. So today is probably the most related lecture that looks at stuff related to SARS-CoV-2. So first of all, this paper I would say is a must read for anyone interested in vaccines. It's really relevant <laughs> at this point in time. You can see this is really new, 2021. Amazing paper. This is a figure from that paper and we'll be using it for a lot of stuff we talk about today. But yeah, this would be the go-to figure for this entire lecture, basically. Sums up everything. Even though we're using a vaccine in this example, the principles of developing adaptive immunity are the same. If we encounter, encounter the antigen or it's through vaccine. So here we'll just go quickly through the generation of immune response to a vaccine. So first, the immune response to immunization with a conventional protein antigen. The vaccine is injected into the muscle and the protein antigen is taken up by dendritic cells. As we talked about, they're the primary antigen blending cell, which are activated through pattern recognition receptors, like we've talked about, toll-like receptors, and other stuff. So they can see the PRR here. By signals in the adjuvant, so this is used in the vaccine to stimulate these receptors, and then is trafficked to the draining lymph nodes. So second, then we have the presentation of the peptides of the vaccine protein antigen by MHC molecules on the dendritic cells, activates T cells through their T cell receptor, in combination with signaling through the soluble antigen and through B-cell receptors, the T-cells drive B-cell development in the lymph node. So they influence each other. Then we have T-cell dependent B-cell de development, which results in maturation of antibody response to the increased antibody, and also to increase antibody affinity and induce different antibody isotypes. As we'll discuss later, the isotypes will switch. We have short-lived plasma B cells, which actively secrete antibodies specific for the vaccine protein, producing a rapid rise in serum antibody levels over the next two weeks. Then we will have memory cells, which will be produced, which will mediate long-term memory. This long -lived, these long-lived plasma cells then continue to produce antibodies for decades and travel to reside in the bone marrow niches. So this is where they're stored. And then finally, we have our CD8 memory T cells, which can proliferate rapidly when they encounter a pathogen and CD8 effector T cells are important for elimination of infected host. So this is when we encounter that pathogen again. So the impact of immunization. As you guys who probably know, immunization has had a major impact on infectious disease incidents. These graphs show the effect of vaccination against endosuria meningi meningitis on the number of cases of group B and group C meningococcal disease in the UK. So before the use of the vaccine, Group C meningitis was the second most common cause of meningococcal disease, responsible for 40% of cases. So here we can see here the difference. We don't have a vaccine for serotype B, but we do for C. And as you can see, the levels have decreased rapidly due to the vaccination. After the induction of the vaccine, the group C disease decreased to less than 10% of cases. While group B meningitis incidence is not affected by the group C vaccine, so now it accounts for the greater proportion of meningococcal meningitis. So this is a visualization of that. Once we implant the vaccines, disease rates go down. So again, from this amazing paper, I will tell you guys to read it several times in this presentation, but definitely check it out. This shows the impact of vaccination on selected diseases in the UK. So the introduction of vaccination against infectious diseases such as diphtheria, capsular group C meningococcus, polio, hemophilosis, influenza type B, measles, and Bordetella pertussis led to a marked decrease in their incidence, as you can see here, group C, vaccine, down, vaccine, similar picture in each, in each graph, but here we have two exceptions. So of note is the increase in H influenza type B in 2001, which led, catch -up, led to a catch up vaccination campaign, after which the incidence was further reduced again, as you can see here. Also for pertussis, a decline in vaccination coverage led to an increase in cases in the late 70s and 80s, but disease incidents reduced after again, after increased vaccine coverage. So this is just to say that as a population, if we let up with these 
vaccinations. So the, these diseases can actually come back. So a lot of this is relevant with people who are anti-vax or don't get their children vaccinated. So how does it work? A really rapid, so this is a really rapid adaptive immune overview. So each T and B cell is specific for one antigen, or more accurately, one epitope. So again, we've talked about this. An epitope refers to the specific portion of the antigen that these cells recognize. So here we can see the epitope. So this would be the entire antigen, but the actual B antibody is only recognizing this unique pattern here. So B cells and T cells see different kinds of epitopes. B cells see free conformational or linear epitopes, while T cells while most T cells see linear peptide epitopes produced by antigen processing, but only in combination with MHC proteins. As we discussed, our CD4, look at MHC 1, 2, and CD8, MHC 1. But we'll get more into detail later. So each B and T cell expresses copies of its unique antigen receptor on the cell surface. The adaptive immune response involves the activation of lymphocytes when they encounter the antigen they are specific for. So we've seen this figure before. We have our activation and then a proliferation into effector and memory cells. So what happens when the T or B cells encounter the antigen they are specific for? So it involves multi-step activation process. For T cells, this requires as an antigen presentation by the dendritic cell, by the antigen presenting cells, which include our dendritic cells and macrophages and B cells, and these activated lymphocytes proliferate, and only the lymphocytes specific for that antigen are activated. So we can see here, we have the receptors of only a few circulating lymphocytes interact with any given pathogen, and we have activation. So this differentiation step follows where activated T and B cells differentiate into effector cells, which act immediately and produce antibody or cytokine production, antibody for B cells and cytokines for T cells, or we can have memory cells, which react with the same antigens encountered again. B cells usually need T cell help, which is important to remember, to become fully activated by antigens. As we'll see later, we have T cell independent and T cell dependent B cells, or reactions, and we'll talk about this later. And these activated antigens make antibodies and generate memory B cells. Exceptions are a T cell, T independent antigens, like I said here, T independent antigens, which can directly activate B cells, but they're less efficient. So these memory cells react when the same antigens encounter again, as we've seen, as you guys probably experienced in your lives. You'll catch a cold one time, and then you'll, we may not know, but you'll catch it again, but your body deals with it before you even know. So here we have a faster response time than those naive lymphocytes. So this is a figure seen in pretty much every physiology textbook and immunology book is the primary response versus the secondary response. So the primary response is the first encounter with an antigen. So here in the figure, we use antigen A as an example. There will be slower kinetics, but the antibodies made in limited amounts. On our secondary response, this is our second encounter with the an same antigen. We'll have a faster response time and a greater magnitude in that response. So it's not only faster, but it is stronger. There's and the response to the new antigen in B shows the memory response kinetics. So this is assuming, so here we have a response to antigen A, slow response, second exposure, boom, immediate and stronger response. And then here, this is just to compare that we also encountered another antigen and it's gonna have a similar response to this one. So here's a more relevant example. So the time course of SARS-CoV-2 infection test positivity and production. So here we see the same kind of slopes. So here we have our nasopharyngeal swab. So this is like a viral load essentially. And we can see we're looking at antibody. So here again, we can see how much viral isolation from the respiratory tract. So our first initial phase, we have much higher. And same here, our viral load slowly goes down. Here we can see the tip occurs when the, we fully develop our antibody responses. This is what's interesting, what a lot of researchers are going to look at is how how long this IgG response lasts. But in all antibody responses, you usually have IgM, acti IgM activated first. And as you can see, we'll have class switching, which we'll talk about later, and this will slowly decrease, while these ones will either be increased or maintained for long term. 
So IgM is usually not involved in the long-term memory, but it can be. So SARS, now we're gonna just talk about some SARS-CoV-2 specifics. So one of the most interesting or most talked about topics here is the spike protein, also known as S protein, which extends from the viral, into the viral envelope, which forms trimers and has an S1 and S2 subdomains. So here's a bunch of different ways to visualize the spike protein. So the S1 is the receptor binding domain, the RBD, which binds to the ACE2 on cells. So you guys have probably some stuff on TV and learning about how the spike protein enters our body through the ACE2 and receptor, which is used in our angiotensin converting enzyme 2, which bi usually binds to this. But So then we have our S2 domain, which is the transmembrane part of the spike protein, which allows fusion of the virus envelope and host cell membranes. So again, ACE2 is the angiotensin converting enzyme, which is a metallopeptidase located in cell membranes of varied cell types and has very high expression on the lung alveolar epithelial tissues. But there's a lot of other stuff I've seen that it's in other locations in our body. So this is why we can have COVID and a lot of other places in our body. It's not just a strict uh, lung disease. So here's more mechanisms. So the spike protein will associate with the ACE2 receptor like we said this s1 then this s1 binds and the virus associates with the host membrane cell then the host cell protease tmpr ss2 cleaves between the s1 and s2 regions and this activates the s2 protein s2 mediates the fusion of the virus and the host cell membranes causing endocytosis endocytosis sorry and allows the virus to enter the cell so we can see here tmpr2 ss2 is type 2 transmembrane searing so again, here are steps. Cleavage of the S protein, activation of S2, fusion of the viral and host membranes. And that's how it enters our cell. So we can see here the host cell entry into the host cell by receptor-mediated endocytosis. So it kind of just sub the whole process. So we see here TMP SS2 activates viral S protein and cleaves ACE2 receptor to facilitate viral binding to the host cell membrane. Here's this paper, if you guys wanna check it out, really good paper. And then we can see here, the virus enters the host cell via endocytosis, releases its RNA, see here, and it uses the cell machinery to replicate itself and assemble more virons. So this is similar to most viral mechanisms. One, infect, once, one infected host cell can create hundreds of new virons rapidly progressing the infection. So we talked about last time about interferon. So this is a key process in SARS-CoV-2 uh, immunity so a lot of people who may not have symptoms might have really strong responses that can actually protect them from this actual symptom so SARS-CoV-2 spike protein binds to the ACE2 which induces endocytosis the virus enters the cell in the in an endosome fusion of the virus with and cell endosome membranes causes the release of the viral RNA genome and nucleocaspid proteins into the host cell cytosol this is where the inf infection cycle is initiated and the new virus is synthesized So here's a more detailed look at the process here. So basically this figure is um, just looking at the entire infection cycle of SARS-CoV-2. And as we can see is a positive sense single-stranded RNA virus. So here are essentially ways we can, these are all different areas we can try and stop the virus. So you see here the infection cycle SARS-CoV-2, but also involves, allows us to choose the best antigens for vaccine. So we need to know how it works first before we can stop it, right? So here we see attachment of SARS-CoV-2 to the host cell membrane, viral host membrane fuse it, fusion and release of viral RNA, translation and cleavage of polyproteins, transcription of the full length strand by replic replication complex, transcription of the replication of viral genome, translation of the structural and accessory proteins, trafficking of newly synthesized viral proteins to the endoplasmic reticulum and to the Golgi apparatus. Then we have our assembly of the mature viron and budding in a budding vesicle, and then the mature viron is then released and can infect further cells. So here we can see this also results in our enhanced pro-inflammatory environment, which is tends to cause a lot of problems in COVID. So antigens. Antigens are substances which are recognized by T and B cells, which are usually proteins, but not always. The epitope is the portion of the antigen that is recognized by a B-cell receptor or T-cell receptor. We can have linear envelopes versus conformational envelopes. 
So who sees what? B-cells and antibodies often recognize conformational epitopes, but can also see linear epitopes. But T-cells usually see linear epitopes. So here are the size of epitopes. So for B-cells, 5 to 7 AA, and for T-cells, 8 to 12. So why do antigens vary in their immunogenicity? What well, makes an antigen antigenic? So this immunogenicity or antigenetic is how, basically means how strong of an immune response it it gets. So some things that like commensal bacteria will have is not immunogenic, or something that SARS-CoV-2 is highly immunogenic. So antigens attribute, so this involves, this is because certain antigens have certain attributes. So some key intrinsic parameters include the size and weight of the molecule. So which are more immunogenic, large or small? So large, so here you can see here, increase immunogenicity, decrease. So you want something that is large. It's easier for a body to deal with. Chemical composition, complex for simple form, and similarity to cell proteins. So we'll go through this figure now. So size, large, means increased immunogenicity. The dose, intermediate, so we don't want too high or too low. We want an intermediate and a basically appropriate amount that we can deal with. So route here from immunogenicity to least, subcutaneous, intraperitoneal, intravenous, and intragastric. Composition, we want complex proteins, which are more, the more complex, essentially, the more chance we have to have immune response. We want to have multiple differences from ourselves. We don't want something that's similar to ourselves. As you can, as we talked about in some other, in other lectures, we can have autoimmunity if something's too similar. So we want something to be different. We want our adjuvants to have a slow release and likely bacteria and have effective MHC uh, interactions. So proteins. Proteins are the most immunogenic antigens. And most of our pathogens are proteins, but not always. The, the proteins have more complexity and results in greater immunogenicity. Carbohydrates are more immunogenic if they have proteins associated with it, such as a glycoprotein. Lipids are poorly immunogenic alone, but there are exceptions. So some lipids can be presented to T cells, and we can improve immunogenicity. We can do this through linking them to a protein. For example, glycoproteins and glycolipids. We also have nucleic acids, which are poorly immunogenic, but there are exceptions, such as anti-DNA antibodies, systemic lupus erythematose. So here are some possible antigenic structures with single and multiple epitopes. So we have haptins, many polysaturides and many homopolymers, and proteins. So here we can see these are kind of things are considered the epitopes. So here we have a lot of epitopes, but they're just the same type. Or here we have multiple different types. So our body's able to basically form an antibody or adopt an immune response against each of them. So haptins are small molecules with a single epitope that can be bound to ant by antibodies, but are too small to effectively induce an immune response by themselves. Haptins must be conjugated to carriers. Usually carrier proteins become immunogenic. So real antigens from pathogens may not always fit the good antigen criteria. This includes bacteria, fungi, parasites, viruses. All have antigens that are not always peptides. So bacteria have surface antigens that vary. This includes capsular polysaturides and cell wall components like tocaic and lipotocaic acid, peptidoglycan components, proteins, and gram negatives such as LPS and OM. And OM. Some act as PAMPs and, and as virulence factors such as tocaic acid, peptidoglycan, LPS. These stimulate tol like receptors and cause excessive cytokine, can cause excessive cytokine production. This is not always bad news because they may stimulate our PRRs, like we discussed, for L like LPS, to optimize APC activity and improve our immune response. Pathogens usually provide several antigens that may induce host responses. So here we have potential antigens from gram-positive and gram-negative bacteria. So all these different things are different things that could stimulate our immune response. So it's not just we're out of luck if one thing is just not a protein. So we have multiple ways to deal with pathogens. So some key antigens for viruses. This includes the viral caspate proteins. If the virus is enveloped, develop proteins and glycoproteins. The RNA or DNA in the virus can also activate PRRs like we discussed earlier. The ones that are located in the endosome and can be used to produce viral proteins but are poorly immunogenic on their own. 
So there are certain challenges with viruses. So like which epitopes will use for protective immunity? So viruses have, several viruses have ev evasion tactics. So some viruses can change surface protein profiles to evade host response. For example, influenza can have gene rearrangement and mutations, which changes annually. This is why we have a vaccine so often. HIV has continual mutation and is yet to have successful vaccinations. SARS-CoV-2 also has mutations. We have changes in the, there are changes seen in the spike proteins, as you guys seen with all the new variants being discussed. And there are evasion possibilities. So it is possible that we won't, the vaccine might not become ineffective. But as for now, I believe it is still effective against all the current variants. So again, optimal antigens. Pathogens are complex. They pro typically provide several different antigens for presentation. Most are chemically complex. Some will be immunodominant and some activate B cells while some activate T cells. So in protective immunity, we'll have antibodies against bacterial toxins, which can neutralize. And for viruses, we can have antibodies that neutralize and opsonize. But we really need cytotoxic T cells activity, which is also a key goal to actually kill our infected cells. So now we're going to discuss immunization. So this is kind of like the history of immunization. Many of you guys have seen this and heard about Jenner and his how we inoculated an eight-year-old with cowpox lesion material from a milkmaid and gave them immunity against smallpox. So early immunotherapy strategies, there's vaccination with cowpox to prevent smallpox, which is the variola virus. Modern smallpox vaccine uses vaccinia virus, which is related to cowpox. Virulation was an even earlier form of immunization using material from smallpox postules to induce infection and provide protection against reinfection. So this is basically our earliest example of the use of vaccination or immunotherapy, immunization, sorry. So the types and goals of immunizations. So we have active immunization versus passive. Active immunization aims to induce an effective immune memory to provide protection from specific pathogens or toxins. Efficiency is affected by the route, dose, type of antigen, and the individual characteristics such as the participants or the individual's MHCs. In a primary immunization, the primary immune response will have the priming of the immune system and induce our memory cells, T and B cells. In our secondary response, or booster dose, will have increased intensity of the response, will have a greater magnitude of the response, and higher affinity antibodies will be made, mainly IgG, as we saw in that figure. We want IG, IgM will go down and we'll have increased IgG. These booster doses can be used at intervals to reactivate immunological memory. So we see this in SARS-CoV-2 with our two uh, vaccines, how most of them need two shots other than Johnson & Johnson. So, yeah, again, it's just that booster shot to boost our response again, and it also results in something called affinity maturation, which means that our system will actually work again to find the most effective and strongest antibodies against that pathogen so we'll actually improve our defense and not just boost it and yeah we, it's been reported that we might need our booster shots for SARS-CoV-2 like you know maybe next year as well to see depending on how the pandemic goes then there's our passive immunization which is the administration of antibody which involves temporary protection and active immunity is not induced so this is seen in several conditions where you can literally be injected with certain antibodies and these will attack certain pathogens but it's not your own immunity, you don't get that memory. This is seen in in the fetus with the pregnant women. So certain immunoglobulins will pass through the placenta. This doesn't give permanent immunity to the child, but they will last for several months. So differences between primary and secondary responses. So repeated immunization leads to higher frequency of antigen-specific B cells, higher antibody affinity, so as we said, affinity maturation due to somatic hypermutation and selection by antigen and induces class switching from IgM to IgG or IgA. So we'll get to this later, but this is important, as well as somatic hypermutation. So these are our current vaccines available, at least when this was published. You can see here it's not 100% recent, but... Several antigens are used for immunization include toxoids, so these are denatured toxins, and attenuated virus vaccines, conjugate vaccines, and inactivated or subunit vaccines, 
split vaccines and recumbent vaccines. So you can see here, we don't have the RNA virus like the Pfizer here, but we'll talk about that later. So for example, diphtheria and tetanus, this is one most people get every 10 years for the tetanus toxoid, these are toxoid, and this is acne virus. This is a good figure to go through if you're just curious. So another common one is here we have tuberculosis. If you guys have seen the TB test, this is very common. This is the actinase strain of the virus, or mycobacterium tuberculosis, or BCG as you'll see it. And then there's multiple different kinds. So here's another figure from the guide to vaccinology. So this is more updated and very interesting. So this is a schematic representation of the different types of vaccines against varied pathogens. The table also shows against which pathogens certain vaccines are licensed and when each type of vaccine was first introduced, as you can see the date here. So again, another good figure, a little more detail than the other one, but here we can see the new RNA vaccines. Then here we have other ones that are coming up in experimental, bacterial vectored, and antigen presenting cells. So these are things you can look up if you guys are interested. So again, one recent one was Ebola, where we used the viral vector. So here we can see with the pathogen gene. So these are really interesting viruses, I mean the vaccines. And again, go to this paper if you want a more detailed view. So for another example here is Canadian immunization on influenza. So this is updated every year by the public health agency, this uh, immunization guideline. And it's also, and it's based on the WHO recommendations. So our influenza vaccines are based on the H and N hemagglutinin and neuroamidase proteins. So here we see hemagglutinin, but these mutate very rapidly. So we have to change them quite frequently. So there are two categories authorized for use in Canada. We have inactivated influenza virus vaccine, you know, the IIV, and we have the live activated virus vaccine, the LAIV. So the inactivated influenza vaccine includes the split virus vaccines, where the virus is disrupted with detergent and subunit vaccines. And here there are different formulations. So when you go to get vaccinated, you can kind of figure out, if you really were curious, you could ask which one you're getting. I'm not sure if to tell you, but you can ask, you can try. So again, the influenza virus strains used for vaccine preparation vary from year to year in order to match the prevailing strains causing influenza infections. The IIV includes split virus vaccines, as we said, and subunit vaccines. So here are the recommended composition of influenza vaccines for the use in, 2020, in 2021 in the Northern Hemisphere. So it's recommended that we get the quadrivalent vaccines for the use for 2021. In the northern hemisphere so this includes these four types an egg so yeah these are all the different things that'll be in the vaccine so again you can go to the who if you want more information you can search that right here so adenated viruses so adenation produces live strains that replicate poorly and they're unable to cause disease but still induce immunity so the advantage of the adenated virus is that it closely resembles the original pathogen in structure and, revolts and has an effective stimulation of an immune response. Disadvantage, it should not be used in immunocompromised individuals. So even though it's attenated, it's weakened. So there's still a chance that you can have an infection with it. So traditional methods for attenation include we culture the viruses in non-human cells. And these mutations produce attenated strains unable to cause disease in humans but still has the antigens to induce an effective immune response. So for an example, we'd have atinated influenza vaccine. It's also a cold adapted strain that replicates best at temperatures in the nasal mucosa, not in the lower respiratory mucosa. Newer atination strategies include to mutate and delete genes needed for virulence and create non-pathogenic strains able to induce immunity. So now we don't have to wait for these mutations to occur. We can go in and do it ourselves in a lot of new scenarios, but they can be more expensive. So now we're going to look at protein or polysaturated conjugate vaccines. So protein polysaturated conjugate vaccines include antibody producing plasma cells by cross-linking B cell receptor. However, affinity maturation of the antibody response and the induction of memory B cell do not occur, which is unfortunate. 
So protein polysaturated conjugate vaccines can engage T cells that recognize the carrier protein as well as B cells that recognize the polysaturide. T cells help th then help the B cells, leading to affinity maturation and the production of both plasma cells and memory B cells. So that's what we want. So this is what we're saying, how like most of the cases we want to add add a vaccine, add uh, proteins to our different vaccines to actually get the proper response. So here when we just have a polysaturide, we only get the small, essentially innate response of IgM and IgG, IgG2. But here when we have a carrier protein added to the system, we can get that adaptive response and get our T cells involved, which stimulate B cells, and we get our IgG1 and IgG3 and our memory B cells. So conjugate vaccines are involved in combining thymus-dependent and thymus-independent antigens. The combinations of thymus-independent and thymus-dependent microbial components in conjugate vaccines can be effective vaccines. This includes a capsule polysaturide, which is a thymus-independent, like we looked at in the last slide, and the protein, which is thymus-T-cell de dependent. Sorry. B-cell specific for polysaturide include the membrane immunoglobulin B-cell receptor specific for the polysaturide becomes cross-linked by the repeated polysaturide epitopes and will cause B cell activation. The B cell endocytosis, the B cell receptor and antigen complex, and this processes the protein component and presents it to class two MHC. The B cells then present the antigen to the T helper cell, which results in T helper cell activation. This T helper cell then provides help to the B cell, which is very important. The result is that the, we'll have class switching and memory B cell generation, which gives us that long lasting and effective immunity. Here we can see the interaction between our B cell and T cell. And then we have the P cell activate and class switch to produce long lasting immunity. So adjuvants, so you guys have probably heard about these and how they're used in pretty much a lot of vaccines to help strengthen the response. So this is just a list in this figure, the common adjuvants and their use. So there's a ton here. Common ones we see are alum, that's probably one of the more common ones, but we'll keep going here. Common adjuvants of the use. Adjuvants are mixed with the antigen and most include dead bacteria or components that stimulate antigen-presenting cells like chondritic cells. TLRs and other PRR ligands can serve as adjuvants, such as cell wall components of bacteria, polysaturides, and bacterial DNA. We can also have muramyl dipeptide, which is a glycolipid from the mycobacterium as it has adjuvant activity through the NOD receptors, which we discussed in the other lecture. Then we also have NF59, which is an oil and water emulsion, which is used as an adjuvant in some influenza vaccines. So some adjuvants are still being worked out, so it's not, we don't, we probably likely don't have the most efficient adjuvants yet, but we have some good ones. So we have our toll-like receptors, which transduce signals from PAMPs to active antigen presenting cell activation, resulting in cytokine production and expression of co-stimulatory molecules, which enhances the response of antigen used for immunization. So one example is alum, which activates NLRP3 inflammasome that we discussed earlier and induces IL-1 beta secretion, so pro-inflammatory cytokine. These TLR ligands and other microbial components can act through the PRRs to stimulate our antigen cells in innate responses, which can increase cytokine and co-stimulatory molecule production and cause improved efficiency of immunization. So here's a bunch of potentials or currently used adjuvant sites that we could use. So again, our TLRs, if there's ways to stimulate any of these TLRs, we can boost their immune response. So again, here's another figure that kind of summarizes all the different types of vaccine. So our inactivated virus vaccine here, such as, I believe that's a SARS-CoV-2 protein. So again, this is just another figure from that paper pointing out to what our potential targets are for SARS-CoV-2. Here's an, so again, another really good paper of interest in the vaccine. So first we have the inactivated virus vaccines, which are viruses are physically, physically or chemically inactivated, but preserve the integrity of the virus particle, which serves as the immunogen. Then we have our DNA and mRNA vaccines, which have the advantage of rapid manufacturing against emerging pathogens. For DNA vaccines, we use viral antigens encoded by recumbent DNA plasmid, which are produced in the host cell via sequential transcription to translation process while mRNA vaccines 
are synthesized in vitro by in vitro transcription and they produce viral antigens in the cytoplasm through direct protein translation. Then we have our live attenuated vaccine. In this strategy, the virus is attenuated by in vitro or in vivo passage or reverse genetic mutagenesis. The resulting virus becomes non-pathogenic or weakly pathogenic, but retains its mutagenicity by mimicking the virus infection. So these can sometimes increase, result in the strongest immune response, but are also the most dangerous. So we can use a protein subunit, which is a strategy that uses only key viral proteins or peptides that can be manufactured in vitro and bacteria, yeast, insect, or mammalian cells. This is what we're seeing right now with the spike protein. So the largest number of SARS-CoV-2 vaccine candidates in both clinical and preclinical stages are based on the strategy. We also have our virus-like, our nanoparticle vaccines, which are structural viral proteins, which are co-expressed to form non-infectious particles as a vaccine immunogen. They resemble the real virons, but they lack the virus genome. So they're basically replicas. Then finally, we have a viral vector, which is where genes encoding for pathogen antigens are cloned into non-replicating or replicating virus vectors, such as an adenovirus. The antigens are produced in, by transduced host cells after immunization. So that was a lot, but here's just a little more detail. So again, this is what's currently being used in most vaccine is the protein subunit vaccine, where key viral proteins or peptides are manufactured in vitro in bacteria, yeast, or insect, or mammalian cells. And again, several of the vaccines candidates are using this type. So here's a good figure. Again, if you want to slow it down and check out these figures, this gives you a little more detail. So here are virus-like particles, which are co-expressed to form a non-infectious particles as the vaccine immunogen. They resemble real virons, but lack the viral genome. So here's an example where they're looking at it with a spike protein. So here's a, the link if you want to take a look at these different types of vaccines and the figures. Here's the MNR vaccine, which is here we can see the Moderna. So here's how they designed it. So the MR vaccines, the mRNA encoding the desired protein is packaged into a lipid nanoparticles. Here we can see the mRNA is lipid nanoparticles and they're able to enter cells. This mRNA is translated into the cell to produce viral antigens in the cytoplasm. So essentially we're going in and replicating this antigen and then our immune system will target this antigen that we actually replicated in our own body but it's non, not dangerous. So here's our non-replicating viral vector where the genes encoding the pathogen antigens are cloned into non-replicating or replicating virus vectors and the antigens are produced by transduced host cells after immunization. So what makes an effective vaccine? So again, they need to be safe, actually protect us, give long lasting protection, induce antibodies, Ideally, induce protective T cells and have practical considerations, as in don't be overly expensive, easy to transport, lack of side effects, and accessible to a wide range of populations. So, they must be safe and used appropriately. So, example would be the attenuated live vaccines that we talked about, which should not be given to immunosuppressed individuals. They should be immunogenic and induce sustained immunity, so we want that long lasting immunity, and ideally, not have to get it every year. They're able to produce protective immunity. Ideally, we want our vaccines to induce both antibody and cell-mediated or T-cell responses or the most effective response for each pathogen. So certain pathogens might be better dealt with with antibodies, so it won't matter if you don't get the cell-mediated, but ideally we want both. So some might be more responsive. We want our neutralizing antibody, so stop infection, and we want our T-helper instead of toxic T-cell activity. And we also, again, practical considerations such as the cost, storage, for example, with the Pfizer and Moderna, we have to store it at extremely cold temperatures, so this makes for a lot of shipping and handling problems. So ideally, if you could have the Pfizer vaccine without needing to be refrigerated, that'd be easier. But that's one of the drawbacks to the mRNA vaccines in comparison to the others. So again, that's the end. I hope you guys liked that lecture, since it was pretty relevant to SARS-CoV-2 and our current, unfortunately, pretty crappy situation. At least it's good for immunological research. It's pushing a lot of boundaries and like things like the mRNA vaccines are pretty much changing the field and it could blow up the field like and we could have vaccine for so many different things in our lifetime. And it's really interesting topic, but 
it's moving fast. And yeah, I hope you guys learned something. Take care.